Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Navigating the Digital Library and Archives at AmericanAncestors.org. My name is Ginevra Morse. I'm the Vice President of Education and Programming. I will be your moderator for today's program. American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. I also want to note that we are broadcasting from our homes to your home with various limitations and distractions. We do apologize in advance if there are any interruptions from our end. We thank you for your patience. Uh, even if we were to lose connection, uh, you will still have access to a full recording of this presentation on our website. So our presenter today is Curator of Digital Collections, Sally Benny. Sally joined the American Ancestor staff in 2010 and works in the R. Stanton Avery Special Collections Department. She has an MS in Library Science with a concentration in Archives Management from Simmons College. She previously worked at the Schlesinger Library on the History of Women in America. Her genealogical interests include Nantucket, Virginia, North Carolina, Cornwall, Finland, and Sweden, and her, and her archival interests include digital preservation and digitization. So our newly redesigned digital library and archives contains thousands of digitized materials from three repositories at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. Those are the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center, the R. Stan Avery Special Collections, and our research library. And you're going to hear more about each of these three repositories in today's session. So after providing some background on this resource, Sally will discuss what types of digitized materials you're likely to find and then guide us through searching, accessing, and navigating the website. And I do want to note that the resources that we'll be discussing today are different from the searchable databases found on AmericanAncestors.org. The Digital Library and Archives is yet another resource and tool that can really augment your genealogical research. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question into the panel to the right of your screen. We'll address those at the end. Uh, there is no handout for this session, but you will be able to watch a recording of this event starting tomorrow. So if you miss anything on today's first listen, not to worry, you can always go back and re review the presentation later. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Sally. Hello everyone, and thanks for joining me this afternoon for an introduction to our new digital library and archives site at digital.americanancestors.org. The digital library and archives, previously known as American Ancestors Digital Collections, was redesigned and launched in September of this year. The digital library and archives, or DLA, contains digitized books and manuscripts from the R. Stanton Avery Special Collections, the NEHGS Research Library, and the collections of the Jewish Heritage Center. So let's start with an introduction to the Digital Library and Archives site and how it came to be. In case you aren't familiar with it, this is the homepage of the Digital Library and Archives. So some of you may be asking yourselves how the Digital Library and Archives fits in with the rest of the resources offered by American Ancestors. What is the DLA? And how is it different from the library catalog and the databases on AmericanAncestors.org? The Digital Library and Archives is designed as an online library and archives for any type of researcher, including genealogists and historians. Everything in the DLA has browsable images, allowing users to virtually flip through a book or folder of archival materials. Some items also have full text, searchable transcriptions, but they are not indexed by name like a genealogical database. Also, the digital library and archives only contains material that is held by American Ancestors and NEHGS. In contrast, the databases on AmericanAncestors.org are designed specifically for genealogical research on individuals and families. The databases are indexed and allow searching by name, date, and place. 
The databases include records from the collections of American ancestors and NEHGS, as well as records from other partnership organizations. And then we have the library catalog. It contains information about all of the holdings, such as books, manuscripts, periodicals, and so on, of the NEHGS Research Library, Special Collections, and the Jewish Heritage Center. The library catalog also contains information about how and where to find these materials. It's searchable by title, author, subjects, call number, and keyword. Please note, however, that the keyword search does not search the full text of the item, but rather searches the full text of the catalog record about it. So the Digital Library and Archives had its start in the digitization program of the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center, then known as the American Jewish Historical Society New England Archives. The Jewish Heritage Center, or JHC, began digitizing their collections in 2007. They moved to a new, easier to use online system in 2012, which allowed their researchers to more easily access their digitized collections. In 2014, after JHC became part of American Ancestors, we, we began working together on a joint digital collection site, which would contain material from both JHC and American Ancestors and NEHGS. The existing JHC website was redesigned to incorporate material from NEHGS as well. This redesigned site, American Ancestors Digital Collections, was launched in March 2016. We began to work on redesigning and upgrading the site two years later, and in September of this year, the site was relaunched with a new name, Digital Library and Archives. And now you may be wondering why we decided to change and rename the site now. First, a new version of the software that runs the website came out. In order to take advantage of the new features, we needed to migrate to the new system, which required redesigning the entire website. The new system creates a website that is responsive, so that it resizes to fit the screen of any device, including cell phones, tablets, and desktop computers. The site is also easier to find in search engines, and it's more accessible, allowing those who use screen readers or other accessibility tools to use the site more easily. Since we had to redesign the site anyway, the Digital Collections Committee decided to do some research and make sure that the new site met the needs of our users. We conducted user surveys and a usability study to learn more about how members were using our existing digital collections site. After our usability study, we identified improvements to make and new features to add that would fit our users' needs and improve their experience on the new DLA site. We then custom designed our site for a cleaner and more user-friendly appearance. We also learned through our user surveys that patrons were confused by the previous site name. Most believe that the, the digital collections site was linked to or part of the American Ancestors databases. They believe that by accessing the American Ancestors databases, they were also accessing the digital collections, which wasn't correct. The new name, Digital Library and Archives provides clarification and distinguishes the DLA as a non-database resource. So now I'm going to describe the kinds of material that you can find on the DLA. The DLA site is home to digitized materials from the three repositories at NEHGS. These three repositories are the R. Stanton Avery Special Collections, the Research Library, and the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center. Currently, the DLA has over 780,000 digitized materials within 32 collections. A DLA collection may include either one large archival collection or many smaller archival collections and books with a shared theme. For example, JHC has a digital library and archives collection called Family and Individual Papers, where users can browse a group of small archival collections. In contrast, another JHC collection called the Weiner Family Papers includes only one 
very large archival collection. The DLA contains both published and unpublished resources, including letters, photographs, newspapers, genealogies, city directories, business records, organizational records, and much more. Let's go into the DLA collections in a little more detail. The, the New England Historic Genealogical Society began collecting manuscripts shortly after it was founded in 1845. After collecting for over 170 years, our Stanton Avery Special Collections, our manuscript collection, contains a wide variety of materials on the families and history of New England, other regions in the United States, Canada, England, Ireland, and other European countries. Special collections includes family and personal papers, like letters, diaries, scrapbooks, and photographs, military records, church records, town records, cemetery inscriptions, and family Bible records. We also have a large collection of unpublished genealogies, the records of several family associations, and the genealogical research collections of a number of well-known genealogists. There are 12 collections in the DLA listed here, which are based on manuscripts from special collections. The contents range from business records, church records, records pertaining to specific wars, personal and family history records, local history manuscripts, and many more. While some of these collections focus on content that is frequently used by genealogists, others contain material that is of interest to all researchers, including historians, students, and genealogists as well. One of the most popular collections from special collections is family registers and Bible records. It contains decorative family registers and original Bible records from New England, New York, and other selected locations throughout the United States. Some of these records have been transcribed and are full text searchable. There are some type transcriptions of Bible records as well. Other popular collections contain church records and family histories. As with the Bible records, most of the church records are original, but the collection also contains some type transcriptions. Many of the churches in this collection were located in the Boston area, but there are also records from churches throughout the Northeast. The Family History Manuscripts collection contains just a portion of the genealogies that can be found in special collections. Everything in the Family History Manuscripts collection is unpublished and is either unique or there are only one or two other copies available at other libraries. This digital collection contains both handwritten and typed genealogies. There are also some small collections of genealogical research, which may contain a variety of materials such as notes, family group sheets, and correspondence. There are also several collections that focus on American wars, the French and Indian Wars, the Revolutionary War, and the Civil War. While these collections do include some military records, such as orderly books and muster rolls, they also contain many examples of personal documents, such as letters and diaries. These materials document the personal experiences of soldiers from New England, New York, and other states. The Family and Personal Papers collection contains documents created by a variety of families and people in the course of their personal lives. The collection includes letters, diaries, poetry, and other material. Most of the documents in this collection date from the 18th to 20th centuries. A few were created even earlier. There are over 60 diaries written by students, ministers, women, and others, describing everything from the weather, their social lives, and their travels in New England and beyond. Among other things, this collection also includes a small collection of letters to and from Benjamin Franklin and his sister Jane Meekham. There are also letters written by several American soldiers in World War I. These are just a few of the collections that are based on manuscripts from the R. Stant Navery Special Collections. I encourage you to explore the other collections and find out what they have to offer. The Research Library has three DLA collections, 
city directories, family history books, and local history books. Digitized versions of these books are only available at the Digital Library and Archives. Most of the books in, the, in these collections are older books that are in the public domain, but some are newer volumes that we can put online with the permission of the author. The City Directories collection contains over 120 directories from New England states, such as New York, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and other states. As you can see, city directories may contain more than lists of names and businesses. They may also contain maps, advertisements, and details about local history and government. The Family History Books collection contains over 400 volumes about families from all over the United States, Canada, England, Ireland, and other countries. Most of these genealogies are full text searchable. The Local History Books collection contains a wide variety of published material on specific locations. In addition to histories of towns and counties, it, it includes vital records, church records, transcriptions of town records, cemetery inscriptions, and more. Next, we have collections from the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center, formerly known as the New England Archive of the American Jewish Historical Society. The Jewish Heritage Center collects the papers of Jewish families and institutions from Boston, New England, and beyond. The JHC has 17 collections in the DLA listed here, featuring the papers of families and individuals, organizational records, business records, newspapers, synagogue papers, and much more. Now, JHC holds the records of many institutions, including community service organizations, trade organizations, Zionist organizations, burial societies, synagogues, and academic and cultural organizations. These collections may contain financial records, membership lists, correspondence, meeting minutes, and other records documenting the institution's activities. Some institutional records currently online include the Combined Jewish Philanthropies, the Jewish Community Relations Council, synagogues like Beth Israel in Cambridge, and organizations such as the Merits Relief Association. JHC also has many collections of the papers of individuals and families. Personal papers may include such things as diaries, correspondence, photographs, scrapbooks, newspaper clippings, school records, artifacts, clothing, and other materials. Some families and individuals were involved with institutions and businesses, and therefore their collections may also include records from these organizations. An example which is online is the Stanley and Marianne Snyder Family Papers, which also includes some records related to Elm Farm supermarkets. The Jewish Boston Times collection includes all of the existing issues from 1945 to 1992. They are all online and the full text is searchable. This is an excellent genealogical source as it contains obituaries and marriage and birth announcements. Issues that are missing or otherwise not complete are noted on the introductory page of the collection. The Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society in Boston was established in 1904. The organization ensured that Jewish immigrants had access to holiday, holiday and religious services and kosher food, provided shelter and social services, and assisted immigrants with finding employment and schools. During World War II, Hyas arranged for sponsors and worked continuously to help the many Jews who wrote to them for help. But immigration quotas made it extremely difficult for them to assist. The digital collection focuses on the case files for each immigrant and their family who received assistance through the Hyas Boston office. The collection is searchable by name, country, language, and year. 
new case files are added to the DLA on a monthly basis. Now that you know a bit more about what you can find at the Digital Library and Archives, I'll go into some detail about how to use it. To get to the Digital Library and Archives website, you have several options. The most direct way to get to the DLA is to go right to the URL, digital.americanancestors.org. The next way is to follow the links on americanancestors.org. Go to the menu bar from any page on the American Ancestors website. Under Search, there's a link to digital book and manuscript collections, and under Library, there's a similar link. Both of these links go directly to the DLA homepage. Lastly, you can access the site from the library catalog. Whenever a digitized version of a book or archival collection is available in the DLA, there's a link in the library catalog record. It's just above the call number and it will take you directly to the digitized version of that material. So now let's go over how the site is organized. From the home page shown here, you can immediately perform a search using this form near the top of the page. This will search the entire website. Further down the page, there are links to a page for each repository that contributes to the DLA. To focus on the material for one of these repositories, select one of the images. I'll discuss the repository pages later on. Further down on the home page, there are several options for browsing the site. You can also find these options under the browse menu at the top of the page. At the bottom of the page, there are some featured collections from each repository. Moving back up to the menu at the top of the page, Browse provides a list of the options for browsing the DLA. I'll show you how those browse options work in a few minutes. The How To menu provides some guidance in case you need some help using the site. These include search tips and frequently asked questions. Lastly, we have our About pages that give users more context about the site and each repository. There's also a page on rights, access, and use for those who have questions about copyright and permissions for using these images elsewhere. So a few minutes ago, I mentioned that the home page links to pages for each of the repositories that contribute to the DLA. If you click on one of those images, you'll go to a repository page like this one. This one happens to be the page for the R. Stanton Avery Special Collections. This page lists all of the collections, digital collections from special collections. To see more, just scroll down. You can see a brief description of each collection if you hover over the picture. You can also get to this page by going to the Browse menu and picking repositories. The search bar up here at the top of the page will only search through the collections of this repository. So now let's pick, pick a collection. I'm going to pick family and personal papers here in the bottom row. And that takes us to the collection landing page. A collection landing page provides a general overview of the collection. It explains what types of materials you can find in the collection and describes the original sources used to create it. This page may also link to finding aids or catalog records, which provide more information about the original manuscripts or books. From the collection landing page, you can go here to browse all of the items in the collection. There's also a search bar at the top of the page, which will only search the contents of this collection. So who has access to these materials? 
There are 10 DLA collections that are open access. Open access means that anyone can access them for free and they do not require an American Ancestors account to view. Then we have restricted to research and contributing members. American Ancestors members at the research and contributing levels have full access to all the collections on the DLA. They must use their American Ancestors account to log on to the DLA site. Lastly, we have access by request. Access by request is only applicable to people who do not have an American Ancestors membership and want to access JHC materials. To request access, see the Frequently Asked Questions page for guidance or check the collection landing page for a link to additional information. For a list of the collections in each access category, go to the Browse menu and select Access. If you are accessing the DLA site while not at the NEHGS library, you'll be required to log in to view materials that are not open access. If you're already logged into your American Ancestors account, you can click Log In at the top upper right corner and it will log you in at the digital library and archives as well. Note that logging in at AmericanAncestors.org does not automatically log you in at the DLA. You do need to click on the login button on the DLA site, but if you're currently logged in at AmericanAncestors.org, you should not need to enter your username and password a second time. If you're not logged into your American Ancestors account, clicking on the login link at the top right will take you to the American Ancestors login page. Input your username and password, and you will then be sent back to the page that you were viewing on the DLA. The text at the top will now say logged in. Please note that you cannot log out from the DLA site. Since it's connected to your American Ancestors.org account, you need to go to the main American Ancestors website to log out. Now that you know how to get to the digital library and archives and how it's organized, let's talk about how to browse, search, and view items. There are a variety of options for browsing the, re the resources in the digital library. You can browse by repository, subject, format or type of material, access type, and dates. You can also see a list of all the collections in the DLA. All of the options are available from the Browse menu, as shown here. They can also be accessed from the home page, as I mentioned earlier. So here's an example. In this case, I'm browsing by access type. From this page, you can easily find collections that are open to the public, restricted to American Ancestors members, or available upon request. The repository browse pages, which you can also get to the other browse options from the left column, um, the repository browse page is very similar. It briefly describes each repository, provides a link to the repository's page, and has a list of the collections from that repository. The page for browsing all collections includes an alphabetical list of all the collections on the site. The links on all these pages go to the collections landing page, which provides more information about the collection and what it contains. Other browse options allow you to view available subjects, formats, or dates of creation or publication, and then easily search for those items. For example, here's the subjects page. Popular subjects and places highlighting the strengths of our DLA collections are on the right. There is also a full list of subjects arranged alphabetically. Select a letter to see all the options and click a link to search for all the items on that subject. Browsing formats works the same way. The formats, formats page helps you to find a particular kind of document, such as diaries, photographs, or deeds that are spread out in multiple collections. 
Browsing by date provides a list of date ranges. Select the time period that you're interested in to see all of the items created in that time period. In addition to being able to browse by a collection landing page, the search bar on a collection page, as shown here, will perform a general keyword search within the given collection only. Please note that you cannot search for an exact phrase in quotes using the basic search bar. If you want to search for a phrase in quotes, use the advanced search option with the exact phrase. I'll show you, I'll talk more about advanced search in a few minutes. So here's an example of searching a single collection. Here I entered the name Jackson into the general search bar on the Family and Personal Papers collection landing page. The results are all resources that contain the word Jackson in either the description of a document or in the text of the document itself. If there are too many search results, you can refine your search by using the facets on the left-hand side of the page. You can even change the collections that you're searching by using the collections facet at the top left. To do this, click on the show all button, check the collections that you would like to search, and then click on update. However, any more sophisticated refinements to your search require using the advanced search option. Get to the advanced search by clicking on the uh, clicking on the gold button, or you can get to the advanced search by clicking on the search button, which is up at the top right next to the login. The advanced search allows us to search specific fields of the description of an item. For example, you can restrict your search to the author, title, or subject fields. So let's say that you want to search for works authored by John Adams. When a gen if a general search across all fields would retrieve resources making any mention of him, whether directly in the text or in a title or in the document description. However, searching for John Adams in the author field would get me exactly the resources that I'm looking for. To search for terms in multiple fields, such as author and title, add a row to your search. Advanced search also allows you to restrict your search to a specific collection or collections, just as you can in the search results page we looked at earlier. You can also search using specific search options or operators and within a range of dates. Date options include on, after, before, and between which allows you to provide a range of dates. In addition to restricting your search terms to a specific field, you can also set the type of search used in each row of your advanced search. Searching all of the words will give you a more targeted search with fewer results. Any of the words will broaden your search and give you more results Exact phrase will search for your terms in the exact order and spelling that you enter, and none of the words will, will only bring up items that don't have any of the terms in that row of your search. The advanced search options and operators work in a manner similar to Boolean operator searches, if you're, if you're familiar with those. These options are described in more detail on the search tips page if you'd like to know more. So now let's put together an advanced search query. Though you can't see it here, I've chosen the three research library collections to search from, city directories, family history books, and local history books. Perhaps I want books on Massachusetts, but not about Boston. So I've chosen a subject search for Massachusetts here in the top row, but I have excluded items featuring Boston 
here and excluded them by setting to none of the words. While I could have structured my search so that Boston doesn't come up in any fields, that would have excluded any authors named Boston and books published in Boston. Lastly, I only want books published between 1850 and 1925. So now let's see what I get. And it looks like our search was a success. 18 resources met our given criteria. So as, as I noted, had I not been logged in when I performed this search, materials uh, may have been restricted. Here's an example of what restricted items will look like in search results. Note that you can search and browse everything on the DLA without being logged in, but you will not be able to view the images of restricted material. So here's a basic overview of what you can do when viewing item pages and what I will be covering in the next few slides. It will cover the image viewer, navigation, searching within an item, printing, and downloading. So here's the basic image and page view with the most important features highlighted. This is an example of a diary with multiple pages. The page that we're currently viewing is on the left. Select the View button at the top of the image to zoom in and see a larger version of it. There are several options for navigating within an item like this one. You can move to the previous or next page using the arrows on each side of the image. You can also go directly to a specific page. There are two ways to do this. One option is to enter a number, number in the form here at the bottom of the image. Alternatively, you can select a page from the column on the right, and the page that we're currently viewing is highlighted in yellow. The print and download buttons are also on the right. The search box here will only search within this particular item. If there's searchable text available for a page, the text can be found here under transcript. Click on the little arrow and the text for the page will appear. Further down the page is the object description or metadata of each item. The object description provides additional information about the digitized material such as the author, title, date of creation or publication, and subject headings. There may also be a summary of the item. The object description always contains the call number of the digital item, as well as a link to the library catalog record. The links, as shown here, are controlled vocabulary terms, like subjects or authors. Clicking on the links will search for similar material within this collection. As I noted earlier, if you're not logged in, you can still view and search the description and even the transcription of an item, but you won't be able to see any images or files. Instead, you'll see this message where the image normally is. Clicking on Login in the text works just like the general login button at the top of the page. The login link here will check to see if you're a logged in member at AmericanAncestors.org, and if not, will prompt you to log in. After logging in, you'll be returned right to this page, so you won't lose your place or have to search again to find the item you were looking at. The view button that I pointed out earlier brings up this more advanced image viewer. You can use this viewer to zoom, pan, and rotate images by using the buttons on the left. You can also use this viewer to go through 
uh, items page by page by using these buttons on the right. And click on the X to close the viewer and go back to the regular uh, item view. This particular viewer, uh, this more advanced viewer, also works with PDFs. To see all the pages of a PDF in the Digital Library and Archives, click on the View button. So the box on the right that I pointed out earlier uh, searches within both the transcription and the object description of the item that you're viewing. Pages with search results are highlighted in red. Select Filter to focus just on the pages with search results. So you can also move through the search results within an item using the arrows found in the transcription field. Your search terms are highlighted in both the description and the full text transcription as shown here. Terms may be highlighted in images as well, depending on the item. This is most likely to occur in published books and some typed manuscripts, especially those from JHC. To download individual pages of an item, click on the download button. If the item is based on scanned images as opposed to a PDF, you can choose the size of the downloaded images that you download, as shown here. If the item that you would like to download is a PDF, you'll be able to download a single page or the entire volume or document. Similarly, you can always print out individual pages. Printing image files includes all of the object description to assist you with identifying and citing the source of the material. Most published books also offer the option to print all. This allows you to save and print a copy of the entire volume as a PDF. So, over the last 45 minutes, we've gone over what kind of material you can find on the Digital Library and Archives, how the site is organized, and how to use the browse and search features to find material relevant to your research. We also discussed how to work with an item and how to download and print the pages that you would like to keep copies of. The Digital Library and Archives is expanding all the time, and additional material is added every month. What would you like to see? What books or manuscripts would be especially helpful in your research? I would love to hear your suggestions. Please send any suggestions or questions to digitalaccess at nehgs.org. Thank you for joining me today. I invite you to explore the digital library and archives and get to know everything that it has to offer. Well, thank you, Sally, for that great introduction to the digital library and archives. So let's get to your questions now. Uh, go ahead and type your query into the question panel, and we'll try to answer as many as we can in the time provided. Um, so Linda asks, uh, does the library catalog include resources from the digital library and archives? So if you were searching um, our online library catalog um, and something happens to be digitized and available in the DLA, would you find it there? Yes, you would. So there would be, uh, there's a link up at the top that will tell you um, can't remember offhand exactly how it's worded, but something like available online in the Digital Library and Archives. And we also have a lot of links to digitized materials from other places like the Internet Archive, uh, Hathi Trust, um, Family Search. So we, if when you search our library catalog, you can not only find easily find resources in the DLA, but you can also easily find dig digitized material elsewhere. 
All right, great. Uh, now, Brenda asks, and you, and you mentioned that we have um, church records as mm -hmm. a uh, digitized material that's available on the DLA. Now, are churches arranged such that you could look to see if we have records for a specific church? Um, and how would you kind of go about doing that? Um, there is not a general list of all of the churches. Some of the highlighted um, most uh, church records of most interest or you know something that's oldest something like that a few of the highlighted items are featured on the landing page for the collection but otherwise you could either search for a location or the name of a church or you could just go to browse collection and either browse through what's there or you could try using the facets to narrow things down to a say a particular location all right uh renee asks are birth records available might you find that amongst some of the collections um not specifically we do however have um we don't have things like birth certificates, but there are some baptism records in some of the church records and in the family registers of Bible records, there, there is birth information um, for many of the families there and that that may include details, you know, like details of birth, death, marriage, et cetera, that you might not be able to find anywhere else. And she also asks, and Renee also asks about marriage records. Is that kind of a, mm -hmm. the same thing? Um, yes, more or less that there are particular search records that do include marriage records. And it's the same thing with um, the family Bible records. It just depends on the record. Some of the family Bible records focus more on births. Some of them include everything. Um, some of them have additional material. It, it really just depends. Uh, now, Cynthia is looking for Quaker church records from Maine. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something that we would have on this site or do you have any suggestions on how to find those records? Um. I don't think we have a lot of, I can't think of any Quaker records that we have online in the DLA right now. Um, however, I know in special collections, we do have quite a few transcribed Quaker records from the New York area. I'm not sure if we have any from Maine. However, um, if you're looking to find those elsewhere, I believe probably the best place to find those would be to check the various friends records that are available on Ancestry. They've digitized a lot of the Quaker records, the handwritten ones, as well as um, all of the volumes that of the various Quaker records and encyclopedia by uh, Hinshaw, I think is his last name, and they have a lot of Quaker genealogies there as well. Now, Sandy asks, is there a button or feature uh, to cite the, what you find? So is there kind of a button that, or again, a feature on the, on the website that would capture the citation information from what you're looking at? Not at this time. However, it is something that we are working on because I know that it's something that people are interested in. Um, at the very least, the tool that I'm working on will have a kind of a permanent link that you can easily copy um, to be either a link to the complete item or a link to the specific page. Um, if you would be interested in getting more detail 
if it would be helpful to have more detail included in that tool, free, feel free to send an email and I will see if there's a way to, uh, to incorporate that in the tool that I'm working on. All right. Um, now, you showed us a few ways to browse by subject and format and date. Um, what is the, can you kind of go over what's the best way to search by location? Would you do an advanced search? Might it be under subjects? What do you suggest there? So there are a couple of different ways you could do that. Um, you can browse under subject for uh, locations. They're in there alphabetically, just like every other term. There are some um, in the column on the right where I've where we have popular subjects highlighted. There are also popular frequently found locations, which are kind of general, but they're kind of uh, make it easy to find resources that we have a lot of material on. But the other way that other kind of um, targeted way that you could find items on a particular location would be to do a an advanced search. Um, and I would recommend if you're going to do that to either restrict in the advanced search, either restrict the field um, to, I believe it's coverage, or the other field that you could try if that doesn't get you the results you're looking for. You could also try restricting your search to the subject field. All right, and in, in regards to, because uh, you showed us a few examples where there was a transcript and a searchable transcript, um, do all handwritten items have a transcript? Is that your intention or your goal? Um, you know, how many of those handwritten items have that typed transcript to fall back on? Um, That is a good question. I'm not quite sure what the estimate is. It's it's definitely in the minority. Um, there are certain things like the Bible records that we are actively trying to transcribe because we know that the material there is, is particularly valuable because it is unique in most cases and it's something that's of great interest um, to our members. In other cases, the handwritten documents that are transcribed um, are mainly things that people had transcribed for us previously, um, but we don't really have an active kind of transcription program right now other than for the Bible records. But if that's something that I would certainly be interested in uh, I'd be open to discussing that with any of you if you're interested in transcribing some of these things from home. So that's another thing to feel free to send an email about and uh, we can discuss. That would be great. And I will be including um, the link to the uh, the DLA and um, the digital access email that uh, Sally shared. So if you do have questions or suggestions on materials to digitize and make available, or as she just mentioned, um, if you would like to assist with transcribing some of the handwritten materials that have not yet been transcribed um, and to volunteer your time with us, uh, you can also reach her there. Um, let's see, just a, a few other questions. Uh, Marsha asks, in general, what are the dates included for the city directories? I mean, kind of what's the time frame that we're looking at uh, for those and, and that collection? Um, I know that there are some from the early 19th century. There may be a few from the late 18th century. Um, I would have to double check on that, but they they definitely range from the early 19th century to early 20th century, and they may go a little earlier than that. Uh, now, Evelyn's asking, you know, what records would we have for the 1700s for families in, in the mid-Atlantic, so Delaware, 
Maryland, New Jersey, and Kentucky. They can't be found elsewhere. Um, how would you go about finding that information? Is it again an advanced search, and um, or is it searching specifically maybe what we have for um, published family histories? How would you go about finding what we have uh, for that time period in those places? Um. So when you are searching by time period, that searches the, the date of creation of whatever document it is that's that's in the DLA. So if it's something like a manuscript, that might bring you information on you know, people who lived in a certain place at a certain time. But if it's something like a genealogy that might have been, say, published in 1890, but goes back to the 1600s, that publication date would not um, be useful when you're searching by date. So if you're looking for that kind of thing, um, you know, looking for certain families in certain locations, I think the best way to start would be to do a general search for the family. Um, if that doesn't bring up specific enough resources. Um, you could restrict your search to the family history books or the family history manuscripts or both. And the other thing would be to do an advanced search on location or even a keyword search on location to see what we have that focuses specifically on that area. So it sounds like, you know, if you're looking for specific families, time periods, locations, type of records, the best way to do it is just to kind of explore and do a search. And um, as you mentioned, you do not need to be logged in or member of American Ancestors to just do a search, just to kind of see what we have. You may not have access to the all the results that appear but um, just understanding what we have and how that could potentially benefit your research um, you know a search is open to everyone is that correct sally yes that is correct and it's also because our new site is more um, search engine friendly a lot of the time some of the resources in the dla will come up when you're doing a general you know, search on Google. Um, so that can be just another really easy way to find some of the things that we have. Um, but yeah, it's, it's usually, it's a good idea to just start with a general keyword search. And if you find something you like, then you can log in or explore getting a membership if you are not a research or contributing member of American Ancestors. And if you, you know, aren't logged in and you do a search, you mentioned that some of some materials are considered open access, that they're open to the public. Um, mm -hmm. And just to clarify, so if you, again, aren't logged in, aren't a member, you do a search, would some of those open access items come up and you'd be able to see them or would you still have to create some kind of free account? You can see those without any kind of account. Um, those are totally open to everybody. When you're doing a search and you aren't logged in, you'll be able to see in the search results, the restricted items will be those little gray squares, which I uh, showed in one of the slides. The, the open items will have colorful uh, thumbnails. So basically you can tell that you have access to something by the items that have the colored uh, thumbnails that are not res that don't say restricted item, those are things that you have access to. And yes, they're the open access stuff. You don't need to get an account of any kind. And maybe just one final question before ending for today. So, you, of course, you gave us the option to make suggestions on what to uh, digitize and make available on the digital library and archives. Um, but how do you 
if you don't have suggestions from people, how do you kind of prioritize and think about what collections you make available and um, you post? Um, that is a great question. Um, some of the things that we have some general criteria that we use to select items. Some of it, um, one of the big things is just the kinds of things that we know from experience that our members are interested in or that they've requested in the past here in the library. We usually, um, the only things that we can put online are things that are either in the public domain, things that are kind of in uh, orphan works, they call them, or things where we can't really determine who the copyright holder is, or cases where we have permission. So we basically, we can't put things online that are copyrighted. So those we unfortunately can't uh, put up. We also consider condition. Sometimes condition makes it impossible or very difficult to digitize something, but there are cases where something's fragile, but it isn't so fragile that it, we can't digitize it. So digitization can be in a way of a preservation um, mechanism so that we can provide access without having people touch the items. Um, so yeah, we consider subject matter, um, copyright, or you know, our, whether we have rights to put the material online, we consider um, condition and we also have some themes so we also look at things that will augment the existing collections that we have or would fit in well with the collections that we are planning to put up in the future. All right. Well, thank you again, Sally, for your uh, great presentation and introduction to this incredible resource and growing resource. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. If you have more specific questions about your family history research, you may consider scheduling a one-on-one -on -one, uh, guided consultation with one of our experts or hiring our research services team. You can learn more about those services by contacting the email addresses on your screen. I also wanna let you know about a recent expansion of our free online chat service. You can live chat online on our website uh, with our genealogists Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, this service is open to everyone and can be accessed at AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. And I will be including all of this information as well as a link to the recording in my follow-up email uh, to you later today. So thank you again for joining us. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American Ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more free programs for you and others. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org slash education. Stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic Thanksgiving holiday, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.